Good evening everyone, thank you so much for coming to our first New Zealand Book Month event. Um, we're really honoured to have Peter Graham here, down from Christchurch, to talk about his fantastic book, So Brilliant, Brilliantly Clever, which looks into the infamous Parker Hull murder case from 1954. Just before we get started, I'd like to say thank you to Peter for coming down and opening our Book Month event series, and to our press for their support, and to the University Bookshop for coming along. There are limited copy, copies available of the book if you don't have your copy with you and you're welcome to come and talk to Peter at the end and have your book signed. Um, and to New Zealand Book Month who have sponsored Peter coming to us tonight. So um, we're really fortunate to have, to have that kind of ongoing support from a national organisation. Peter Graham has worked for 30 years in Hong Kong as a Crown Council and Barrister and is now a full-time crime writer. He's the author of the acclaimed book, Vile Crimes, and So Brilliantly Clever, and is currently working on a new book. Brilliantly Clever was listed in the New Zealand Listener's Best Books of 2011 and IndieBound's Top 20. So I think we're going to be in for a fantastic night. Please give Peter Graham a warm hand. for that introduction. I'm, th I'm just um, amazed to see so many of you here, so thanks very much for, um, for coming. And I hope I'm going to be able to talk about the book um, in an intelligent sort of way. It's quite a long time since I've actually um, looked at it. And, I've been, and it's true, I have been working on something else, so my, you know, my thoughts are rather um, uh, overtaken by uh, an entirely different subject. So, Anyway, I, 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 I do know the details of the case um, pretty well. And what I'd like, I, I, I'd very much like it if you, if, if, if you have questions, um, you don't have to wait to the end or anything. You could just um, put your hand up or call out or whatever you want to do. And, um, and I'll try and feel, field your questions because I want to make sure that I'm um, talking about... Um, what you want to hear about, and and some of you will have read the book probably, and some of you uh, will not, and uh, will and, and and when I've spoken at occasions like this around the place, there are usually um, lots of people who have lots of questions. Some of them um, quite difficult ones for me to answer, but I I always do my best, and um, and uh, and also I mean I must say I've. Um, I have, um, since the book was published, um, and I have spoken at a number of events in libraries and other places around the country, and, and I've actually um, gathered some interesting little pieces of information, I mean amazingly interesting little details that people, you know, stand up not so much with a question, but just to give me um, their own little part in this story, and, and, and that's pretty interesting and I've written these things down and I've popped them in a file and if ever there's going to be a, um, you know, a second edition as such then, um, then there would be a few little bits and pieces that I, um, um, that I would add based on things that I've learned um, speaking to, um, to audiences like this one. The, this story does have um, an amazing fascination that um, that seems to endure and and some of you are, I would say are of an age where you would um, remember the events reading about them in the papers and hearing parents and things talk about probably or, or not talk about it as the case may be um, it's a sort of a recurring theme from people of a certain age that uh, say, oh yes, I remember when that of 9.54 and, um, you know, uh, they, the newspapers were hidden away and we weren't allowed to read the papers and, and I think parents were generally very worried that if their, if their, if, um, if their um, teenage children started reading about these events, it might give them ideas and, like, you know, they might start... Um, asking embarrassing questions about what a lesbian is and that sort of thing. Anyway, they just, so that people just um, didn't want to talk about it. But this, but, I mean, I suppose a lot of it is thanks to Peter Jackson's film, um, uh, Heavenly Creatures. 
uh, a lot of international interest in this story, although um, really right from the word go, 1954 in Christchurch, um, when this um, strange murder hit the newspapers, it was immediately seen to be something of international interest and um, the, the, the press from around the world came to Christchurch to report it and, and of course all the press agencies that were a major source of news in those days came to Christchurch and uh, I think in Christchurch, you know, in a strange sort of way, um, although, it was con although it was considered, it was deeply shocking, I mean it was absolutely and utterly, astoundingly shocking, uh, I think that uh, the, at the same time there might have been a little bit of um, that sort of quiet pride we have in New Zealand when anybody um, notices us from other countries, so we're quite pleased that, um, that uh, you know, anybody should take an interest in what's going on in New Zealand. So there was a bit of that um, as well. So I'm not really um, starting at the beginning, but I think that most of you will know who the... I'm not sure I'm at the right angle. If I was around here a little bit better, I might be able to... How's that? And that just means I can keep an eye on both sides and see that you're not going to sleep or anything like that. Um, I think most of you will know the, um, the, the bare bones of the, of the story. This was a particularly brutal and bloody murder that took place in Victoria Park in Christchurch in June of 1954. Uh, there were two teenage girls, one uh, who was called Pauline Reaper or Pauline Parker, as she sort of later became known. Uh, she was always known as Pauline Reaper, but um, when it turned out after the murder that her parents were not married, and that was um, a pretty shocking um, situation in itself, um, the mother's maiden name was Parker. So henceforth, um, Pauline Reaper um, you know, it was felt that she wasn't really entitled to call herself Reaper, and so, and so in the press and in the courts, indeed, she was. Uh, she, she's anyway. She's known as Pauline Parker, so I'll call her Pauline Parker. Um, and the other girl was Juliet Hume, who was 15, uh, a few months short of her 16th birthday, and. Uh, the two of them formed this extraordinarily close friendship. They met at um, Christchurch Girls High. Juliet Hume uh, was born in England. Her family were English. Her father was Dr. Henry Hume, was um, appointed rector of Canterbury College. And he was a brilliant man, a brilliant physicist who became uh, a very well-known um, nuclear physicist and he was married to a woman called Hilda Hume and little Juliet had a very unhappy upbringing. Uh, she was born pretty much in the Blitz in London and there were lengthy periods of separation from her, from her family at a very young age and she had all sorts of health problems and I think she turned into um, a very, she was Hilda was, uh, neither of the parents were uh, at all warm people and I think she became a very difficult child and the more difficult she was, um, the more she was sort of sent away on various pretexts and the more she was sent away, um, the more difficult she became and that's really um, um, the way of the world. Um, but these two girls met up at Christchurch Girls High Juliet was sent to Christchurch Girls High, although she'd been at um, St Margaret's and she'd been at a, at a um, prep school in Hastings in the North Island. That was another instance of being sent away at the age of 12 or whatever it was. I mean, it was a fairly unusual thing to do in those days to send your daughter off to the North Island to school. And, um, and but she had an IQ test and found that her IQ was, I can't remember now, about 120 or something on whatever the scale that was being used at the time. 
and it put her in a very, very high intelligence class and category, and the Humes thought that um, the only school that could properly educate her was Christchurch Girls High, that St. Margaret she'd been to before um, wasn't really about, um, in those days, I should hasten to say, wasn't really about um, getting a uh, serious education if you were uh, if you were a young girl. And Pauline's parents were a very different background. They were um, they uh, the father ran a fish shop. The mother had a boarding house. They really we might say uh, were from a far more humble social background. The two girls became friendly because. Um, Juliet was exempted from sports at school. She had her weak chest, I think it was, that they said at the time. And, and, and Pauline had, had osteomyelitis as a child, and she'd, she'd spent many long, lonely months, and, and uh, so she didn't play sport either. And the two girls, they spent hours and hours sitting around talking to each other, and they uh, this sort of rather unlikely friendship developed. And, um, and they became closer and closer and closer, and the friendship became very, uh, very intense indeed. And it became so intense, in fact, that at one stage, um, um, Pauline was taken off to see a doctor because um, of, well, she had, there were two matters. One was she seemed to be suffering from what today we would um, regard as um, Bolivia, and she was also suspected of um, of having lesbian tendencies, which in those days was uh, being uh, um, lesbianism was um, was considered a um, was one of the personality disorders, and uh, so she was sent off to the doctor. Who, anyway, uh, Pauline was very dismissive indeed of the doctor and of her mother. And, and, and so on. Anyway, I'm just going to cut ahead a bit. Um, the Hume family were returning to England. Uh, the marriage uh, had broken up between Dr. and Mrs. Hume, more or less. She had a lover by the name of uh, Bill Perry. And um, I can show you photographs of these people if, if you'd like to see that. Um, and uh, and um, and uh, Henry Hume, was, although he was a brilliant man, was considered um, a bit of a disaster as a rector at, um, at, um, at Canterbury College. And uh, he was effectively forced to resign by, by a motion of no confidence. And then so he offered his resignation and they, they took it with um, the greatest of uh, alacrity. So Henry was going off, uh, and, and it was decided that they would take Juliet, Henry would take Juliet to stay with, um, he had a sister in uh, Johannesburg, in South Africa, and she would, because she had just suffered from TB, she'd been in the TB, um, in the TB um, sanatorium, and, and, um, and, um, so rather than take her straight back into the, um, into the European winter that was decided that she would um, stay with the aunt for a while. Anyway, the two girls, therefore, were going to be separated. And they thought this was about the worst thing that could happen to them. And, and, and one of the problems was, as I learned, um, was that although Hilda Hume, who was a witness in the, in the trial in Christchurch, she sort of swore black and blue that they had done nothing to encourage Pauline in the belief that she would be able to go with um, Juliet. That was actually very far from the case. And they were both, I think in order to placate Pauline, they were saying, oh, well, you can come, you know, as long as your mother agrees, you can come and uh, you can go with to South Africa with Juliet, and then you can go, then you, when she goes to England, you can go to England. And Henry Hume even offered to pay for her fare. Um, and knowing full well that Pauline's mother would never allow this to happen, um, that Pauline's 
Edward's mother couldn't wait for Juliet and the Hume family to just get the heck out of it. And, uh, and because they felt that she was a very um, unhealthy influence on their daughter and ever since she met Juliet, um, Pauline held her family in great contempt and thought that they were, you know, really just so unsophisticated they were hardly worth speaking to. So anyway, that le left uh, Pauline's mother in a, in a rather vulnerable position of being the only obstacle to the two girls remaining together because Pauline also knew her mother would never allow her to go off with Juliet Hume. They didn't seem to be too worried about the father. The father was a rather meek, mild little man and they seemed to think that, well, if they got rid of um, mum, that would be okay. They would then, they would then be able to, um, then they would be able to stay together. So together they hatched up this plan. The idea actually was Pauline's. It's um, often thought that Juliet was the more dominant character and I'm sure that at the beginning of their relationship that was definitely the case. Uh, she was the one with all the ideas and uh, Pauline was really the, um, you know, the acolyte who hung on her every word. But I think as the, as the relationship developed, Pauline really became um, a, 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 a co-partner and the idea to um, kill Pauline's mother definitely came from Pauline and of course one of the things that makes this book interesting and made it interesting for me to write was that, um, that the girls kept um, diaries. Um, unfortunately Juliet's diary was destroyed, it was burnt just before she was arrested. Uh, by the gardener on the instructions of her father. But um, Pauline's diary survived and, um, and of course it's absolutely a fascinating document because you can just see the whole relationship develop, you can see all their crazy ideas develop and, um, and, and they did have some really, really strange, I mean they thought they were, they thought they were they thought they were geniuses. They thought they had, uh, they believed they had um, uh, an extra part of their brain that um, nobody else had that understood, that enabled them to understand the whole nature of everything, I think was the phrase that, um, that, uh, that uh, Pauline used. And they, they spent a lot of time writing novels, and writing their stories, and they were writing plays just before the murder Pauline was um, was writing an opera and they thought they were going to go off to Hollywood at one stage and have all these um, novels turned into turned into movies and they were they were they, they were besotted by a lot of um, film film movie actors of the time and in particular uh, James Mason some of you in this room probably won't know much about James Mason but anyway he was the great heartthrob as far as they were concerned and they you know they were sort of competing with each other as to who was going to marry James Mason when they uh, when they when they went to Hollywood I'm just going to see if I can show you some of these um, they're in a bit of a funny order can you hear me if I move away from the microphone like that um, they're in a bit of a funny order and I'm just going to whiz through them. This is where uh, really um, the basic scene of the murder. This is Mount Victoria, and this is an old uh, this, sorry Victoria Park, and this is a, a, a tea room, so sort of a tea kiosk that they. The idea was they were going to take they were going to take um, Pauline's mother. They were going for a walk up into Victoria Park, so they got the bus to the sign of Takahi, if any of you know that. It was just about, just after, actually buses hadn't been running, I don't think, for more than a few months, of replacing the trams that used to go up there. Anyway, they had tea and buns and soft drinks and things in the kiosk, and then walked down, there's a gap in that stone wall, and then you start to go down a zigzag. And this is the, actually, this is actually the scene of the murder, and I think that cross there um, was put there by the, by the 
police had to come up. So what they, it, they so they walked down through that gap um, about three quarters of a mile, and you can see that it's a very lonely, isolated spot indeed. They've actually thought about it quite carefully, and they have picked a place that is a very, very isolated spot that is within a bus ride and a fairly short walk of the middle of, um, of the middle of Christchurch. The plan was. I'll come back here. The plan was that, um, and this was a real little Juliet touch, they had a little gemstone that she had in a ring and took up this gemstone and they decided they would use a half brick in a stocking. So Juliet found the half brick at home at her house which was uh, a place called Island, often known as Island Homestead. Quite a you know, big grand sort of house in New Zealand terms. And um, so they had a brick in a stocking. Um, the plan was that Juliet would go on ahead of the other two and she would she'd drop this little pink stone on the, on the path, on the track there. And um, Mrs. Parker, Pauline's mother, would bend. She'd say, oh look, there's a little on the track down there, there's a stone. Mrs. Parker then sort of bent down to have a look at it and um, Pauline came up behind her swinging the um, half brick of the stocking and really let her have it, um, uh, belting her in the head. But it, 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 they thought that it would be much easier than it was. They thought it was like um, they thought it was just like the movies where, you know, you give someone a decent whack on the head and they fall over dead and that's that. And they thought they could just hit her once and she'd fall down dead and then they could roll her down the bank and um, it would look like an accident. It would look as if she just um, tripped over and, um, and, and, and bumped her head. And it wasn't like that. She wouldn't go down. She, would, she stayed on her feet and they had to keep hitting her and they eventually forced her down um, uh, onto the ground and I think Juliet held her by the throat, head up, while Pauline was just bashing and bashing and bashing until eventually she died and there was blood all over the place and it was, a, it was a, just a horrible, horrible mess and then they ran back up to that kiosk you saw in the photograph and, uh, and then started yelling and screaming to the caretaker's wife that there'd been, there'd been an accident, there'd been this terrible accident that, um, that Pauline's mother had fallen over and, uh, and, and uh, she was seriously hurt. So I mean the idea um, just wasn't one that really was very likely to work. Not that the girls actually cared that much about that because um, uh, Pauline did say to one of the um, psychiatrist who was involved in the trial that they uh, that uh, well they thought they had a better than even chance of um, of pulling it off and making it look like an accident. I don't, I don't think they really cared too much because they thought that well even if they get caught and they get sent to prison or Boston or wherever it was they were going to go they knew they weren't going to hang for it. So these days you must remember that, uh, that uh, it was capital punishment for murder uh, but there had been an amendment to the law that said that if you were under the age of 18 uh, you would not be hanged, you would be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. So they, they knew that they weren't going to be hanged and they thought well if they go to jail at least they were together and that was all that mattered. And so the quality of the thinking wasn't actually terribly good and the one thing that they, they failed to take account of was that well, if they were sent to prison, they were going to be separated in the prison system. And that is exactly what happened. I love this. 
this photograph here. This is this was some. Um, yeah. Okay. This is when the um, this was at the time of the uh, the trial or one of the earlier hearings outside the uh, magistrate's court. Um, and uh, it's just wonderful, isn't it, to look at the, um, the coats and the hats and things. Of course, younger people in the room may not know that all women had to wear hats in court at those times on the UK. It was unthinkable that you wouldn't, but if you, if you did, you'd get into trouble for the judge. There's the two girls going to court, happy as Larry, uh, not a care in the world, um, and they really were showing every sign of um, enjoying the attention that they were receiving. I think on the first day of the trial, I was told by somebody who was there, that the two girls, were, there was the cell where prisoners were held in the uh, court in Christchurch were upstairs and the two girls were standing at the window and all the press were around and they were sort of waiting and, they, and they had to go away and get um, sheets of um, newsprint to tape over the tape over the windows to stop them. It's Pauline so, on the left. Hmm? It's Pauline on the left. Yes, that's Pauline on the left and that's um, <coughs> the other one is Julia. That's the court building there. That's not very interesting. You can see that from the Defence Council. What did they do with the bread? With the what? With the bread. Well, they left it. Um, the the brick, yeah, sort of went slightly down off the track. Um, but the the stocking, the, the stocking actually broke at the toe, and uh, the bit of, there was a bit of stocking lying beside the body. So they hadn't been very clever about that either. Um, as to what happened to the half brick people sometimes ask, but I did, I was told by, um, by a policeman that the half brick ended up in the old Christchurch police station for years where it was, um, it was used by the, um, by the uh, CIB as a paperweight. That's Peter Mark, who was um, junior counsel for the prosecutor. And that's the prosecutor. And that's a sort of an interesting, rather tragic, but um, definitely interesting uh, side story, really, is that this man, Alan Brown, who was a very clever lawyer and clever in other sort of ways, he was a very gifted actor, for example, um, he was the prosecutor. And he went mad, really, in the course of the trial. He had a serious drinking problem. Apparently, he was just sort of well, as one of the lawyers said, filling up with grog the whole time throughout the trial. And he went, he went crazy. And you could actually, if you read the transcript of the trial, you can sort of, you can see this happening. And he, um, one of the, the, the main um, psychiatric witness was a man called um, Dr. Reg Medlicott, a very well-known name in Dunedin, some of you all uh, know who I'm talking about. Um, and he, actually, Alan Brown did a very effective job of pretty much destroying Medlicott as a witness. He sort of tore, tore him to pieces, really. He, Medlicott, who was a brilliant man, but he, in those days he wasn't very uh, experienced in giving evidence in court. Anyway, Brown did a very effective job on Medlicott. And then Medlicott, as he got out of the witness box, feeling a little bit battered and bruised, said to Brian McClelland, he said, that man is mad. He's as mad as the two girls, and you just see if I'm not right, he's going to be my patient within the next two years. Well, actually, he was his patient within the next two weeks. <laughs> he, he was committed to, um, to Ashburn Hall. Who was Brian McClellan? He was the junior counsel for Juliet Q. For the defence? For the defence, yes. Why, why didn't they try and Needle appeal against having a prosecutor who was in such a state. Um, um, because it, we just wanted it I don't think it was ever. Well, I, no. I mean, the point is, it was. It, it was. It was not. And um, as, as I say to you, he did a very good job, actually. Um, uh, uh, so I don't think there would be any grounds for saying that um, had 
the head prosecutor. What? No, I don't know. Just a, no. um, but it's just an interesting um, sort of you know side issue as well. So we'll meet the courts for six months. Thought today. Inactive, what? Medlicott's um, assessment of the Well, well Medlicott was running the theory that they were um, insane, and it was a folie ardeur insanity, the two girls each sort of acting on the other, um, to, and, and they sort of became, to put it simply, they became insane together, jointly, and, and, um, and of course, insanity was then, as it still is, was a very um, rigorous and narrow concept um, as far as the law is concerned. So to be insane, you have to be suffering, first of all, from a disease of the mind. And then the second thing is that you, um, you uh, because of the disease of the mind, you have to either not understand the nature and quality of the act, now that means those are people who are so severely insane that they, you know, they don't even know they're killing a human being. I mean, there are cases in the law reports of a woman who stabbed a baby thinking she was cutting a loaf of bread. I mean, that, you know, it's that sort of type of case. So that's, that's one, that doesn't apply here, obviously. The girls knew exactly what they were doing. And, and, and so the question was, that, that was whether or not they knew it was wrong. So to, be, to satisfy the test of insanity, they had, to, they, had to, um, they had to be, because of the disease of the mind, they had to not know what they were doing was wrong. Uh, and I won't start talking about whether that meant morally wrong or legally wrong, because that's quite a complicated issue, and it still is. But, um, but, but anyway, that's where Medlicott had problems because uh, Juliet Hume, for example, was saying when she was asked whether she knew uh, what killing the mother was wrong or not, said, well, of course I did. You'd have to be an absolute moron not to know it's wrong. <laughs> um, so, you know, that sort of thing didn't really make Medlicott's job any easier. And so, yes, so, so he was, um, it was a very... <coughs> Uh, it was, to put it kindly, it was a very, um, it was a very um, fragile sort of defence that was, um, I think, very unlikely to succeed indeed. And, and, and of course, um, they must have encountered quite a lot of hostility from the jury. I mean, their jury just um, hated them. You know, the, he, the idea that these teenage girls the jury were all men in those days, and they, you know, they were, they were, they were tradesmen, and they were people like that. You know, they weren't probably the most sophisticated people on earth. But not that that would have made very much difference. I mean, the community was um, really uh, revolted by what had happened, and and um, I think it was, you know, it was. Pauline's diary, so the intent was all outlined in there, wasn't it? Yes, it was. That's quite right. That, that there was no doubt. That, uh, there was no doubt about the intent. It was premeditated. It was planned. They knew exactly what they were going to do, and um, that made them difficult to defend. And they couldn't. Um, uh, they couldn't. They weren't allowed by their lawyers to give um, evidence in their defence. And this is one thing. I'm jumping ahead now. That Juliet now known as Anne Perry, a very well-known writer of crime novels, who's given a number of interviews on this. And anyway, one of the things she complains about is, oh, we weren't even allowed to speak in our own defence. But, I mean, the reason she wasn't allowed to speak in her own defence was that, I mean, they would have just whatever possibility they had of, of running the insanity defence um, would have been absolutely shattered when they heard Juliet and the way she talked about it. I mean, her arrogance was just overwhelming. I, there's a story I tell at the end of the, just after they've been convicted, and um, the two girls were being carted off back to prison, and um, and Juliet, and they were being escorted by uh, by, uh, by a policewoman, a woman police constable, 
And just as a bit of a kind of a wind-up, uh, Juliet was whispering in a loud, loud sort of stage whisper, oh, the old girl took a bit more killing than, uh, than we thought. Uh, and yeah, who would have thought? That? Anyway, and, and this police uh, woman said, Juliet, that's a dreadful thing to say. That is a terrible way to speak about uh, Pauline's mother. And uh, Juliet uh, turned to her and said, Oh, aren't we the perfect little policewoman? <laughs> I mean, that's what she was like. Oh, she was absolutely terrible. And, uh, and, um, there was a total disconnect of morality. In yeah, in yes, there was, yeah. yeah. So that, this is Pauline, Juliet's mother, and Bill Perry, the lover, Brown Cullen, Henry Hume, father, the mother again, um, and this, and that, this is after they've just heard the verdict and uh, the daughter's been, I mean, it's a great photograph of, uh, of capturing the, um, you know, just that look of utter despair, isn't it, on the, on the mother's face, and that's when they leave the museum. This is now, this is, this is Juliet um, today, it's now known as Anne Perry. She sold 25 million books when I last heard, probably more than that now. <laughs> But, um, but anyway, so she's been very successful, and that's Pauline. Pauline ended up as a, um, well, she went to, um, she went to library school. Lynette, you were just saying uh, what nice people they were in all worlds. <laughs> so she went to library school, and she um, and changed, their, both, both girls changed their names. Um, uh, or they were given a change of name after they were released from prison. They were, they, they both spent um, about five years in prison, and so they were released when they were, well, they were both 21 when they were released, and uh, and uh, Juliet was uh, shipped out of the country, and and um, and Pauline went to library school in Wellington. She was called Hilary Nathan and then she sort of disappeared. But she ended up, she was living, she worked at the Auckland University Library for a while and then she worked at the library in London and then um, she ended up as the assistant um, headmistress at a um, special needs school in Kent in England. And that's what, and I think then she retired and uh, planned she disappeared for years, and then uh, a very a sort of astute New Zealand journalist tracked her down and found her. And this is the time he found her living, living at this house, um, this little cottage in Kent. That's the film version. Now, actually, just on that subject, <coughs> that doesn't seem to work very well. Um, but it, uh, you know, a lot of I mean, I've spoken to um, quite a quite a number of women who, um, thank you, uh, a number of women who were in the, these girls' class at, um, at Girls' Hut. They're now aged about 73, I think. And you just succeeded in turning them off. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and anyway, they just talking about this um, film, Heavenly Creatures, they, the general verdict is that, um, that uh, Kate Winslet, who played Juliet, has really, you know, played the part very well. Looked, you know, looked pretty, pretty good. And the the girl who played Pauline, was her name Melanie Linsky, I think, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Uh, they thought, well, she was actually a bit more, you know, a bit more attractive looking than the than the real life. Um, than the real life. Now. This house, this is, this is interesting, well, it was interesting to me, and it might be interesting to you, that, um, that the house that, that Pauline, I'll call her Pauline, she by then was Hilary Nathan, um, lived in, she was always a bit of a great painter, and that when she, as soon as she was found by the press, she decided to make herself scarce. And she decided to get out, and um, she actually went to live in Orkney, where she lives today. 
and it doesn't get you know you don't get much further away um, than that. Um, and uh, she wanted to get out in a hurry. There was somebody who had a contract to buy the house, and then she heard that they were about to show um, heavenly creatures on on TV in in England, and she wanted to get out quickly. So she left. She left on the wall. This is a sort of a mural that she painted, and uh, we, you can look at some of them a bit more closely. It's quite fascinating, really. But this one, you see this one? Oh, now I'm going to see if this pointer works. Yeah, no, does it? Yes, it does. You see that one there? Now, this is an image. If you, you can't really see it closely enough, but um, to my way of thinking, it's fairly obviously an image of, of Juliet. Juliet in these pictures is always the blonde one, and she looks like a, a sort of a, you know, a heavenly creature, actually, and, and that somebody told me at a, a gathering like this that that is actually um, an image from a tarot card. I don't know if any of you know about tarot cards, but, um, but I, I, I thought that was interesting. And possibly some of these ones might, they look as if they might be copied from something where, you know, some they're fairly sophisticated sort of but let's just have a look at the. Um, now you see, look at this. This is a, this is a Pauline figure, the little dark haired girl. And um, you know, she I don't know that doesn't show you very much, but I mean, she just looks like the. Oh, there we are. Now that's that's what I that's the one I was talking about, the tarot card. So she looks, you know, she's like a she's like a, an angel or a goddess. She's shimmering and shines and. and uh, that is, I would say, is the way Pauline is looking at Juliet at this time, many years, um, many years after they last had contact with each other, it would appear. And now look at this. This is the two girls being cruelly sundered by this large, nasty, Act. And you can see they wear, they're wearing these masks. I mean, I'd really like somebody who you know, knew a bit more about it to look at these closely. But, um, but um, I'm sure that we could um, learn all sorts of interesting things from those images. And this is another, well, it, that's clearly a figure in the womb, but what it means I don't really know. Uh, now look at that. These are the two girls. That's Pauline and that's Juliet. And what a, you know, it was this, it appears to represent perhaps the flames of lust or something. That's the way, that's the way it looked to me. Now here you see the Juliet figure on the horse, um, a winged horse about to ride away and there's Pauline trying to keep this Juliet earth down. Restrain her, keep her, keep her on earth with her by the look of it. Now, look, now this is one. This is um, this is a, obviously a Pauline figure, and I think I said in the book that this is um, about as uh, profound an image of uh, desolation as you could as you could uh, as you could possibly imagine. Um, it is a Pauline figure, and somebody pointed this out to me when I when I was showing it like this, and they said. Oh, and actually you can see Pauline had a great big scar running down her right leg and, and some young man in the audience said, look, you can see the scar is on, is on that um, picture. So, uh, this is, I think, Pauline as a, what is she, sort of a travel looking fallen angel, a bird cage that might represent the prison that she was in, the prison years. This is, when, this is when they did, yeah. This is when they, this is the human family when they first arrived in New Zealand. That's the house island. Thing. Those girls were prohibited legally from seeing each other. Is it the rest of your life? No, I don't. I just, in fact, I don't think it's true. I mean, that's oh. a, it's a, it's um, it's a bit of a sort of folklore. Is that when they were released from prison, they were 
there was an order made that um, that they weren't allowed to see each other again. But um, it's it's not true. It was de denied specifically by the um, by the um, justice minister. But they were set. I mean, I, I think what happened was that Juliet was released a few days before Pauline, and she was put on a plane, and she was got out of the country before. So I mean, in fact, they didn't really have a chance to see each other um, until some years had elapsed. And, I mean, there's there's quite a lot of speculation about whether or not they have seen each other, because now Juliet lives in um, the Highlands of Scotland, Pauline's in the Orkney, they're only 100 miles away from each other, and so there's been quite a bit of discussion about whether or not they um, have seen each other or not. Um, I, I'm inclined to think not, although there are people who disagree with that. And, um, Somebody wrote a play, there's a playwright called Trevor Schmidt, he might be Canadian I think, he wrote a play, the premise of which is the two meeting together in their sort of present age. But I don't think so, and I, 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 my sort of um, thoughts on that I think to some extent were confirmed by, uh, there's a New Zealand journalist Chris Cook who fairly recently contacted um, contacted Anne Perry, otherwise known as Juliet, uh, and said to her, oh, have you, you know, you know that Pauline's just living in York, do you ever see each other? And she absolutely exploded, certainly not, why on earth would I want to do that? Oh, <laughs> this is the way she talked. Um, but are these, this, this is the girl, that's Pauline's father, as a young man. Oh, now that is not a, this is not a great photo, but, um, this is to show. Um, this is to show the actually the house that Pauline lived in is this one here, and we, that's the that's the closest we've been able to come. It's now demolished, so this is the closest we've actually been able to come to finding. But everybody says it's it was very much sort of like this. It was like a big house, and it was rather ramshackle, and um, and uh, it was. Um, a board, you know, it was a boarding house where young sort of students and, and, and uh, that's 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 Julia at the age of fourteen or thereabouts. Is Hilda Hugh and also Bill Perry. And now this is quite interesting. You see, when somebody mentioned the diary, and of course the diary was uh, an extremely uh, incriminating document. And the actual original of the diary no longer exists, but the police made a made a typescript of the diary that was put in evidence, and uh, I managed to get a copy. And I had to it was actually it was I had to make an application to the court to get a copy of this to get access to the diary. So I, I was very fortunate that I was allowed. I and mean, I just thought it would be a bit of a formality, but. <coughs> I have heard of other people subsequently who've applied and been refused. So uh, when I heard that, I thought, oh, well, you know, thank goodness that I managed to. But um, there were a few pages of the diary photographed by the police and shown to the court just to, you know, so the jury could actually see what they were like. But um, but this is, um, I think this is an absolute um, Classic, this one. So this is the day of the murder. She's lying in bed in the morning, Pauline, writing the entry of her diary. And you can see the little heading she's given it, the day of the happy event. I'm writing a little of this <coughs> up on the morning before the death. I felt very excited and the night before Christmas-ish last night. I didn't have pleasant dreams though. I am about to rise. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. Um, but anyway, they, 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 they didn't, you know, the diary was a was a damning was a damning document. And, and, you know, she made no attempt to hide it. It was just when the police found it that was just sitting on a on a sort of bedside table in her um, in her bedroom.